Welcome everyone um, and thanks, thanks for being here today. Um, this is the first event of the Innovate Manchester program, Future Everything, uh, which I'm uh, representing, um, is delighted to be curating these Innovate Manchester events um, on behalf of Midas and uh, GC Business Growth Hub. The events, these events are part of a wider EIRDF uh, funded program uh, designed to facilitate inno uh, innovative business collaborations across Greater Manchester. Um, today we have, we have with us a great lineup of speakers, which you will get to know uh, better uh, throughout the webinar. Um, just to name, we have like Vikas Sa, who is former chair of Future Everything and an entrepreneur and philanthropist based uh, right here in Manchester. Um, he's also a visiting professor at MIT Sloan in Lisbon and an honorary professor at the Alliance Manchester Business School. He's going to be um, a co-host today and chairing the panel um, discussion later. Um, we also have Professor Michael Saver, which is professor of uh, polymer science in the School of um, in the School of Natural Sciences in the University of Manchester, um, where he also leads initiatives in sustainable polymers, um, plastics, and materials for the Henry Royce Institute. We have Sophie Walker, who is the Chief Operation Officer and co-founder at Disposal. Um, which you will have a really interesting presentation later, hopefully inspiring. And um, Stuart Hayward Hyam, who is the Technical Development Director at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK LTD. Um, as I said, please make sure that um, you have your full name as attendees. We're going to be using the Q&A functionality for all your questions. Feel free to be sending questions as we go through the presentations. Um, and we will try to address as many of these as possible later um, um, after, after the, the discussion with the panel. Um, and um, with no further delay, uh, let's start. So um, I'm George Konstantakopoulos, just to introduce myself as well. I'm the Business Innovation Lead for Future Everything. And um, quick run through of, of the um, agenda today. Um, we're doing the welcome and intro. I'm going to introduce you to the Innovation Lab, which um, is coming next week. Um, as I said, our, our keynote speaker is Professor Michael Saver. When then we were having some thought provocations from um, Sophie Walker and Stuart Hyard, uh, Hyam. And then we're going to enter the uh, panel discussion. Now, a bit um, about Future Everything. Uh, we're a female-based, Manchester-born and based um, social enterprise working across um, arts, culture and uh, digital innovation. Um, innovation is, our, um, is about creativity and it's our domain of expertise. We are on a mission to make functional change to the world around us and we've been kickstarting conversations and co-designing the future of digital culture with communities around the world. Um, we are um, a globally known um, organization. We've been uh, running projects in Spain, Qatar, US, Moscow, Singapore um, since 1995 um, when we were, were founded. We are powered by our region's initiative, Innovate Manchester, and um, we are very inspired and we are really, really looking forward to be part of creating collaborations in the key thematic areas, which I'm going to describe um, in, in a bit. Um, if you're wondering what is um, that thing on your screen that is moving, um, a bit of background on kind of projects that we do. Um, it's a software which creates an artistic interpretation of soil moisture and temperature data generated, data generated by citizens. This was part of the Grow Observatory uh, project, an Horizon 2020 innovation program um, that managed to validate satellite products using citizen generated data. Um, an overview of the actual data and the map. Um, and let's move on to the Innovate Manchester program introduction. So today we're here today for the changing the way we produce and consume um, event. And there are three more themes. There are four themes in total. Um, the sustainable cities and infrastructure, the digital futures, data and ethical tech, and the future of human experiences and human-centered design. Each event is going to have a conference this is what we're here today, and it's going to be followed up by an innovation lab. Um, if you have any um, interest in being informed specifically about these events or anything in particular, you can get in touch with the info at um, midas.org.uk email, and the hashtag that we're going to be using in general for the program is the Innovate Manchester. So if you are tweeting about this, feel free to use the hashtag. 
um, a few words about the Business Growth Hub Innovation Team who are going to be supporting the collaborations. Um, they are offering like fully funded one-to-one -one expert support um, to develop and progress the innovation opportunities. Um, they have a team of experienced advisors. Um, many of you in the audience might already um, have been engaging with their team and they have um, access to uh, 5,000 innovation vouchers, 5, 5,000 pounds innovation vouchers, which can be used uh, to access the expertise, resources and specialist facilities. Um, a member of the team, if you are um, come forward and you are part of a collaboration project, will be following you from today's event and uh, to discuss any individual support that you might want. And for anything further, for any further information that you might need, um, you can get in touch with them at BGH innovation at growth co uk um, now the innovate manchester program um, overview and the different themes that are going to be discussing today um, and also are going to be part of the um, innovation labs next week um, we're looking into sustainability as innovation driver cultural and behavioral change um, designing sustainable products or services enabling circular economy um, the digital transformation and the new technologies, um, supply chain innovation, and of course, across the board, like business continuity. So, um, as I said, next week we're running um, an innovation lab. Usually that is an event that is taking place on a full day workshop due to the fact that this is taking place virtually now. Um, we've split that into two days. So if you are being invited to, to join us, which I'm going to um, run you through the process, um, you are then being asked to be with us next Wednesday at half nine to 12, and next Thursday, half nine to 12 again. Um, the whole idea for this being split in two is that we're going to be um, looking initially to the um, problem space. So on the first day, we're going to be analyzing the problems and the challenges that you're going to be um, focusing on and working on. And on the second day, we're going to be looking into the solution space. Um, so that's why this is split in two. It should be like a full day event, but as I said, it's um, split in two on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, so, from here, um, I want to hand, on, hand, hand over to um, uh, Vikas, who is going to take the lead and is going to introduce the um, first speaker for, for the day. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, when I was chair of Future Everything, it always amazed me at how this you know, SME in Manchester was able to work with some of the biggest companies in the world and do just, you know, the most incredible things. And I think that's testament to what innovation is now. You know, even going back nine or 10 years, the kind of technology that we're using today for you all to be able to join us remotely was only really available to some of the biggest corporations as part of their extraordinarily expensive video conferencing suites. And it kind of proves to you that right now, the technology needed to innovate, even at scale, is available to small businesses and corporates, which highlights the need for those collaborations that we're going to talk about today. And so I'd like to introduce our first speaker of today. Professor Michael Shaver is the Professor of Polymer Science in the School of Natural Sciences at the University of Manchester, where he leads initiatives on sustainable polymers and plastics for the Henry Royce Institute, which is the UK's National Advanced Materials Science Centre. He's the director of the new Sustainable Materials Innovation Hub there, supporting SMEs all across Greater Manchester to make smart, sustainable material choices. He's published over 100 papers, delivered over 80 invited lectures, and has been recognised with numerous prestigious awards in his field. So without further ado, we're very much excited to uh, hear your presentation today. Welcome, Professor Shaver. Thanks very much. Hopefully you guys can see slides now. Yes, good. Um, so I, I often start with this uh, slightly combative graphic um, because we're in a really weird time right now. And, uh, you know, originally, I would talk about how climate change was going to decimate us all and we needed how to make these really 
sustainable solutions and this was all rooted in in plastic and how we think about materials and circularity right now we've got um you know challenges around coronavirus we've got uh, a recognition of um decades if not centuries of racial injustice and so it's it's an odd time to uh, be an innovator. It's an odd time to run a business and it's an odd time to, to try and make a difference. But I would argue that it is the time to deliver on something because we've got to work together to be able to change the future. And so the end is really the beginning and that's the point of having this slide. Um, I'm a plastics guy. Uh, I think you're going to hear a lot about waste from uh, the three speakers who are, who are gonna talk to you today. Uh, and being a plastics guy, uh, I was a, a villain for a long time. Um, but really, this is about understanding the value in materials and the, the way that we can make a difference. Uh, so my role is, is split kind of across the university and the Henry Royce Institute, so I have both a local and a national role. Uh, and if anything, I, I talked to you about today sort of sparks something, uh, then send me an email and, and we can find a way to help you. Um, so really this starts uh, from the realization that it's all your fault. Uh, so individuals make decisions, you get up in the morning, you choose uh, what to drink your coffee out of. Uh, and so you could choose the styrofoam cup or you could choose the ceramic mug and those choices have consequences, right? And so if we want to save the world, you know, if I'm doing this in public with actual human contact, I'd ask everybody and get you to raise your hands in terms of whether or not you would choose the styrofoam cup or whether you would choose the ceramic mug. Uh, and every single time I've ever asked a group of people this, everyone chooses the ceramic mug. Uh, but this is really dangerous because I can make transport use and dispose of over 500 styrofoam cups for the energetic cost of one ceramic mug. And so if we think about our commodity that really matters as being energy, then actually we've got to be able to think about our material flows in a different way. Because the reason plastics are so important is they are really, really efficient to make. They're of the most efficient processes on earth. They're very lightweight, so they're really easy and energetically minimizing to transport. And so if we want to switch to a material where we've got to dig up clay, we've got to fire a kiln up to a high temperature, we've got to uh, take that heavy mug and deliver it to let's go for m and uh, We've got to pick that up from m and 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 take it home. That all has energetic costs that we need to take into account. So plastics are really important from that perspective. But the challenge here is, is about reuse as well as our single use. And of course you could say, well, I'm gonna take my nice ceramic mug and I'm gonna reuse it. But if you reuse it and you wanna wash it in hot water, well, you've gotta heat the water up and you've got to clean the water up after you're done with it. And that's the energetic cost of two styrofoam cups. And so we have an idealized view that plastic is the devil here, but we've got to recognize what we're doing is a comparative view of what alternative materials we have available. So this is the kind of thing that we work on is actually giving objective, honest views on what the most sustainable choices are you have available. So if we think about the broader role of plastics in our world, you do away with plastics, the uh, volume of packaging waste you produce uh, would increase by four, your food spoilage would potentially double, your vehicles are heavier so your petrol costs increase, and you lose all of uh, the innovations we've made around modern insulation and so all our energy costs go up. And so if I wanna try and quantify that, this is done quite a few years ago now, but this was in 2012 estimated to be around 583 million gigajoules of energy per year. It's a meaningless number to me as a scientist, to you as an audience. But if we think about that uh, sort of barrel of oil, how much does a barrel of oil cost? That's something that we can conceptualize. And plastics saves 100 million barrels of oil per year. Now we use a lot more oil than that, but it's a significant number that if we were to make a change and move away from plastics, 
we face serious energetic consequences of doing that. If we wanna convert that over into CO2, so Greater Manchester, we've got this idea that we're gonna be carbon neutral, uh, hopefully even someday carbon negative. That's the number of kilograms of CO2 per annum that plastics is gonna save. And so the idea that we're gonna have zero plastics and carbon neutrality is just, there's absolutely no way that we can do that. Plastics must be used as part of the solution and the reality is, is that we have to change the way that we value that material and the way that we treat that waste to be able to capture that value and to ensure that we're eliminating plastic release and not eliminating plastics. Uh, I don't know if you guys recognize these folks. Uh, this is Extinction Rebellion. Uh, Extinction Rebellion did a, a little event uh, in Manchester and I met quite a few of them. Uh, and it was really interesting talking to them because the way that people have perceptions around the material world is very different than the reality. Uh, so this is uh, them outside of the London Stock Exchange. And the reality is, is we think of plastics as being packaging, right? I went out and I got a ready meal. It was in some plastic packaging, that's it. But the reality is, is the, these are uh, materials that are called polymers. And those polymers are in textiles, those polymers are in the face shields, that are now so integral to our PPE around coronavirus, the polymers that are in electronics, in our footwear, and in the adhesive that attaches uh, this guy's hand to the wall. We have a complex material universe that we've got to deal with. Well, you know, Stuart has to deal with it, and Sue has often, uh, but we've got to understand the complexity of our material world to know what innovations we need to apply and where we need to apply. So why do we have so much plastic? Well, if we come back to that idea of packaging, we've got a, a real desire to improve our way of living. Uh, and that means that we want to minimize things that seem wasteful. And so plastics were introduced to extend the shelf life of food, to allow us to have energy efficient food distribution, to give us the opportunity to eat pineapple in Britain ever. Food safety standards are also integral to this. We've got to ensure that that food that we distribute is safe. And so we wanna prevent people from getting sick, prevent them from dying. That's something that plastic is doing that's really important. We've gotta keep doing that. The meat up at the top, which is the sexiest steak? Well, it's the one on the left. And that's often down to marketing. We've put that meat on a black background and it looks better. And so people will pay more money for that meat because it's on a black background. But it's much more difficult to recycle that material. And so that's something we should stop doing because it's not integral to the way we're using those materials. And so sustainability really comes down to making a decision about why something is there. Is that the best thing that you can do for it? And understanding complexity is essential because that's not a single plastic, a single piece of packaging. It's a plastic tray or a plastic reinforced paper tray. The film on top is probably five different layers of plastics, each a micron thick. Uh, you've got adhesives and heat seals, usually two. You've got a plastic reinforced paper label. And underneath it, you've got an absorbent mesh thing that it soaks up your meat juice, right? And so when we're then looking at what end of life options we wanna have, we've gotta deal with not just wishful thinking, but societal realities. Because we can convince someone to rinse a paper tray or a plastic tray and put it into the recycling bin and we could recycle it. It's a little bit more difficult to get them to do that with the film. And it is impossible to get someone to take something that's been soaked in raw meat juice and put it into their recycling bin. Different solutions for different material problems is essential. So we're not gonna have a world where one, um, one solution or one innovation fits every need. And of course, we are now in a, a brand new world where our views of plastics are very, very different. We use plastics because they can prevent infection, they can prevent the spread of disease. We use plastics because of the consistency of their production, their use, their distribution. We use plastics because it's really easy to sterilize those. 
We need to keep doing those things. Do we need to have plastic cups in hospitals? Do we need to have surgical kit excesses? Do we need to use this when we have convenience as the framework? No, of course not. We can stop doing the things that aren't necessary. We can keep doing the things that are essential to our well being. And finally, what kind of uh, innovations we're developing need to be viewed through a very honest lens. So here I'm giving you an example. Hope there's no one from Mum and You on the line, uh, but these are called 100% biodegradable baby wipes. Uh, they're not 100% biodegradable. Uh, in our labs, they're about 30% biodegradable. It's a really good way to make microplastics and nanoplastics in terms of this degradation. It also says it's 0% plastic, when in fact, all that it is, is a biodegradable polymer, a biodegradable plastic. Uh, so there's real challenges around what these words mean, because industrially biodegradable or industrially compostable is very different than biodegradable in the environment of release. So what's gonna happen if you uh, unfortunately flush this down the toilet? So what does sustainability actually look like? Uh, so if we take that world of polymers and our material um, uh, world around us, and this extends not just to polymers, but to all of the different materials we have in our lives, they hold massive societal value. And in almost all cases, the alternatives will produce more waste and more CO2. So we have to be including these plastics in our resource flows, but we've got to use them differently. And we've got to use them better. And that means we've got to prioritize reuse, prioritize reduction first, but where we can't prioritize reuse, develop ways to recycle that and recycle it efficiently. When we can't recycle that, we want to think of degradation. And that's not bio. That means we want to be able to degrade that in a selective way. If bio is a solution, sure. And if we want to then think about uh, uh, an end option, then at the end, we're thinking about something like energy from waste. And this is all about retaining value in our material flows. And so if we were to have this plastic free world, then what we're thinking about is not a sustainable material, but a sustainable system. And if you have a sustainable system, that means you have to have collaboration across the supply chain. And so if you are an innovator and you're at a single point where you're seeking an innovation and you only deal with one step before you or one step after you in a supply chain, you have lost value because it's about retention of value across the supply chain that's essential. And I think that the last thing I'd wanna say before I get into some of the specific stuff that we do is past tense terminology is essential here. It does not matter if something is recyclable. It does not matter if something is compostable and it does not matter if something is biodegradable. It only matters if something is recycled, composted or biodegraded. And so if you innovate or you develop something or you adopt a new solution and you haven't considered the local waste management practices, then you are lost. And I'm really happy that I don't have to talk about local waste management practices because the next two speakers will do that. Uh, so I run what's called Rethinking Resources and Recycling. This is a program funded by the EPSRC. Uh, and it recognizes that me as a material science is only part of the solution. Uh, so homodisciplinarity is very difficult to solve these problems. You've got to include material science, social science, manufacturing. And this is a program that we started uh, more than a year ago now, which brought together a variety of different academic disciplines and partners uh, to sort of develop our understanding and develop interventions that support uh, businesses in making the right changes. One of the things within this framework is a program that's called One Bin to Rule Them All. Uh, and that's run by myself, Helen Holmes, who's a social scientist, Maria Sharmina, who's an economist, and Martin, who's a postdoc who works with us. This project was developed entirely by stakeholders. So we didn't say, okay, this is what's needed. This is stakeholders coming in and saying, well, this is an interesting thing we wanna do. And it takes the idea of we wanna be more ambitious and have an imagined future. So this idea that you guys could do a divergent and then convergent thinking, this is something that we ran with stakeholders. Uh, a little more than a year ago now. And it starts from the premise that anything that the public thinks of as being plastic, you could put into one bin and how would sorting work? And so this is not something where we've got the technology uh, to deal with this right now, but it's an imagined future that then explores what are the contestation or fracture points that we need to deal with in order to get to that stage. 
And the focus becomes elimination of plastic release, not elimination of the use of plastic and the retention of that plastic in the highest value condition. And that's through reuse, it's through mechanical recycling, and it's through chemical recycling to try and eliminate them. So how would that look? Well, this is actually quite an old picture now. Uh, our, our partnerships, the industry people we work with are dramatically different, um, but uh, it gives us a picture of, of where we were perhaps six months ago. Uh, and this idea of having one central bin means that we can sort based on some sort of marker instead of some sort of backbone. And this could be a variety of different markers. We're not beholden to any one of them. It could be an embedded die, or it could be a printed die, or it could be full blockchaining of materials. But that allows us to say, this is the best pathway for retaining value in a material, instead of this is the material we've got to group it all together. And so instead of saying, okay, we're gonna put all of the polyesters into uh, one pathway in uh, Suez's uh, MRF facility, we're able to say, well, these ones are actually going to retain more value for Suez as a company and segregate those. And you can see from this community that we've brought people from across the supply chain with very different expertise to try and look at these contestations and answer questions um, around them. And it's really interesting to look at the fracture points between different parts of the supply chain as a way to, to develop solutions. And this is something that we're continuing to work with these partners with. The key things I think I wanted to bring up here are, you know, there's really interesting material science uh, parts of this that are rooted in innovation. Uh, the first is on selectivity in terms of chemical recycling, where really we can say there's a diminutive form of chemical recycling that's emerging that would give us fuel feedstocks or a bunch of random chemicals. If we can do that much more selectively, you retain more value. And so there's real uh, innovation, at least in our lab and, and in others uh, in the area around that idea of selective uh, uh, degradation. Uh, the recycled tipping points, how you actually improve the quality of mechanical recycling of your materials, uh, is a really important area for us. And thirdly, how you would develop a new economy, a new idea of circularity where perhaps you're gonna develop plastic materials that are gonna be refillable uh, or reusable, and how do you make those uh, more robust, but still ensure that those are recyclable in the end. So those are three challenges that we actively work on in our group. Uh, and if you're interested, we can follow up on them. Um, but this idea of being uh, industry focused and focusing on stakeholders uh, was sort of why I was recruited to Manchester in the first place uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and this is for this role in the Henry Royce Institute and the lab that I'll be pitching next. Uh, so the idea that we've got a capability around synthesis, a capability around material valorization and waste management in what we call the hierarchy of materials, and a capability around the assessment of environmental degradation, both in terms of recyclic quality and in terms of biodegradability and composting. And so within this facility, which is being built, and so we're on the sixth floor of this building, which as soon as lockdown is done, uh, we can hopefully uh, get on to fitting out this floor. This is the capability that we have available in Greater Manchester to be able to support you. And this support uh, is growing. Uh, so we, uh, through the ERDF, uh, now have funding for a 10 million pound uh, facility. And so uh, while Midas can offer you innovation support in terms of developing your business plan uh, and uh, looking at how that would work in Greater Manchester, this is much more specific. So if you need uh, advice, if you need uh, assessment of materials, and if you need help in translating those materials to different partners, we are available to help you. Uh, and if you're an SME in Greater Manchester, we can do that uh, for free. Uh, and so we've got a vast array of different characterization facilities uh, that are currently distributed, but are, are gonna be centralized as soon as this lab opens, that allow us to do polymer processing, uh, allow us to do degradation experiments, allow us to do mechanical and thermal testing, all to support your innovation. And so if you're interested in the Sustainable Materials Innovation Hub, then get in touch. Um, our group is, is very diverse. We've got lots of different projects. I've just touched on some of them, but I always feel this need to uh, put up a, a vast array of names to really showcase how this is not a, a, a problem that's solved by an individual, it's solved by a community. 
Um, so that's it. Uh, I'll end with my beginning uh, and thanks a lot for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Professor. And that, that was a fascinating presentation. You know, just, just some of the key takeaways around the choices that we make, around the realities of sustainability, and actually breaking some of those myths that we see, I think was, was really enlightening. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. Um, I'd like to now move on to our thought provocations, where we've got two speakers with us to kind of share their presentations just to get us thinking a little bit more about these issues before we then go into the Q&A. So first we'll have Sophie Walker, who's the COO and co-founder at Disposal, and then Stuart Haywood Hyam, who's the Technical Development Director at Suez Recycling and Recovery in the UK. So let me just tell you a bit about Sophie before we bring her on. So Sophie, as I said, is a, is a co-founder of Disposal. They're a clean tech company. So along with their sister social enterprise are on a mission to empower people to make better decisions with their resources and waste by increasing transparency and accountability to make a positive impact on the environment. Prior to founding the company, she gained a degree in conflict resolution, probably a useful one for today's times, cycled over 8,700 miles around North America and enjoyed, and enjoyed a winding career encompassing supply chain in the food industry and sustainability. She's been shortlisted for the Northern Power Women Outstanding Entrepreneur Award and was voted fifth in the 2019 Resource Hot 100. She's also the secretary of the Waste Compliance Task Force and an alumni of the CSC Leaders Programme with Common Purpose. So over to you, Sophie. We're very excited to hear your thought provocation. Thank you so much. Okay, let me share my screen. So whether you call it rubbish or recycling resources or junk, it's something that every single one of us deals with and yet few of us understand. And that's a problem because there's a veneer of simplicity that hides a complex web of interwoven waste companies and it obscures your ability to know if you've met your legal obligations or understand the fate of what you throw in the bin. It's extremely hard to make informed decisions about the right thing to do with your waste and on the whole, people opt for the cheap and easy option and you end up with a global waste crisis. So yeah, I'm Sophie, I'm the co-founder of Disposal. We build easy to use software solutions to make monitoring your organization's waste supply chains simple. I'm guessing that most of you haven't thought too much about waste and that if you asked what happens to your rubbish, it would look a bit like this, a sort of simple chain. And I'm guessing that you'd expect your responsibility to that waste to end when it's taken away by a waste contractor fact is it looks more like this and your legal obligations don't actually end until your waste gets to the end of its journey so if it ends up with a red dot a waste criminal you're liable you can be fined or prosecuted and with waste now high on the public agenda it will damage your brand the problem is that these waste pathways are they're constantly shifting and especially in times of flux like a pandemic so for almost everyone that we've spoken to, waste compliance is either a time-consuming manual task or something that they simply don't do, just trusting that their contractors are doing the right thing. But with waste crime costing the UK economy an estimated £1 billion a year, clearly not everyone is doing the right thing. So we bring transparency and clarity. Clarity? Clarity. <laughs> Our digital tools map your waste pathways, streamline your evidence of compliance, and minimize your risk with automated notifications. We focus on compliance because you need to keep waste in the system to have any hope of it being recycled or treated as a resource. And if you want most people to comply, then you need to make it really easy for them to do so. We call this passive compliance. The lack of digital systems in the industry, along with the fact that what little data does exist is patchy, siloed and generally poor quality, enable an environment in which illegal activity can thrive. We need transparency and accountability. Open data and standards help with that by enabling digital systems that make it easier to gather, link, monitor and analyze data. When we started Disposal, we thought it was just probably SME waste companies that were digitally immature, but actually really it's the entire industry. Where it exists, so much waste industry software is monolithic legacy tech. 
unlike in most areas of business where the software that we use daily is built with interoperability in mind. So, you know, like being able to connect your accounts package to your CRM. If we're to tackle waste crime and transform how we value the materials that flow through our economy as waste, we need a digital transformation of the whole industry driven by interoperability and innovation. So it works for everyone from the one man band to the multinational organization. So much of the stuff that we produce and consume has a longer life after it's discarded than it is while it's in use. And yet we have almost no visibility of its journey once it's thrown away. The circular economy is about so much more than just recycling on steroids, but to allow us to transform the way that we produce and consume, we need to understand that crucial part of a product's journey so that we can reimagine, redesign, reuse and repair. The digitalization of our waste supply chains built on open principles is the catalyst that will allow that transformation for the benefit of society, the economy and the environment. Thank you. Thank you for the thought provocation there, SOV. I'd like to now introduce Stuart, who is Technical Development Director of Suez Recycling and Recovery. He's responsible for a range of development activities across the business, delivering tools, techniques and information to meet business needs and customer solutions. The main activity themes he's involved with include harnessing waste as a resource, energy and biofuels manufacture. He's also involved in sorting instruction and value chain enhancement for waste mix resources. Alongside that, he's also engaged in understanding more about how the influence of carbon, biodiversity and natural capital are making a difference. He's got over 25 years of experience in the industry, a whole range of skills across the field, and we're looking forward to hearing your thought provocation. So over to you, Stuart. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, to uh, to get through hopefully that's visible to everybody so all right around okay so um i'll carry on as is um so who are suez well i was asked to give a quick introduction it's part of a, a worldwide company that operates in five continents um over 90,000 employees Key number there, we spend uh, over 100 million euros a year in R&D, uh, and that's increasing. Why do we do that? It's not because we're a university, it's because uh, innovation R&D is a fundamental part of our business. So that's as much about us. Um, the system we're in, and Sophie's given a good kind of picture of the complexity. Uh, I spend my life trying to simplify stuff. So uh, it's very simply, um, people buy stuff, they use it, and then they put it into the system, and designers and other people make choices which influence how it's consumed and discarded. We then have to try and make the best out of it, be it recycling or disposal or other processes, involve a lot of different things to get those resources recovered and put in the system. Um, and as a business, we're growing into having to work in all of those things, to go back to designers to understand how they can change design to make it easier to see, uh, to extract or to be consumed. So where are we as a business? Well, we're on that arrow that goes between linear and circular, um, as is society as we go down the route. So we've got a whole pile of different services. We're a commercial organization, so we have to understand how we do it, uh, who we do it with, how can we get consumers to change their processes, how we can provide services and the skills and the resources that make each of those circular arms work in the right way, and how do we get the business functions from government and taxation the business systems uh, orientated in the right way to, to work. Um, I hate data, but I love data in the same sense. I hate data because I find it um, tedious to pull together. I love data once I've got information out of it. Um, I just throw this up a little bit. Um, the data we have, although it's, uh, Sophie rightly says it's in pockets, um, I can tell from the data that we get what different businesses use and what they use differently by size of company. Um, we weigh all of our customers now in our commercial business customer uh, base. So we know what they produce, how often they produce it. We know when they're having a clear out. Um, we can uh, peer review them against the others in the same sector. So we're able to see that, but um, we're at the tip of that iceberg. We're kind of at the point of understanding that nectar at the other end might be useful. 
Um, and I just put a picture on uh, on the two right ones of this is the changing composition of the waste that we've seen through COVID. So different materials peaking. The uh, the pink circle is business as usual, um, and where the uh, line is above that, that's where we get more material. And you can see that over over the time of, of the COVID lockdown, the materials we get back are changing, which gives us an influence on what society is doing, how we consume at home differently to how we consume at work. That sort of information is just as powerful at our end of the sector as it is for supermarkets and for nectar. So what does the data tell me? Well, it tells me lots of stuff. It tells me when the sessions start. So what do you do as, as, as Suez, where we do lots of innovation work um, from uh, very much uh, R&D, money in, knowledge out, through to uh, co-joined projects. Uh, we've done projects on extracting the wood fibres from MDF and financed a, a startup to, to build a small pilot plant in uh, Chesterfield. Um, we uh, co-invest in businesses like Rupicom and TerraCycle so that we can then work uh, with an agile startup uh, and learn some of their technique. I would say we, we, we join partners so we can dance better um, and we build and industrialize. So we were one of the first companies to take lamp or gas and make vehicle fuel out of it, a kind of green um, liquid biomethane. Uh, we were doing chemical recycling uh, six or seven years ago in the UK on a plant that was about 7,000 tonnes. Learned lots of lessons out of that. Um, one of those big ones is uh, the, the energy market or the oil market doesn't necessarily respect our local markets. So it's always makes life challenging. So we do all of that range. Uh, we're looking at protein from waste. So um, protein is far better than uh, other forms in terms of recovering it because we can save land, water and fertilising and growing food for animals by recovering it from the food waste you throw away. So very much looking at some of these new tools, techniques, as well as data in that process. So thank you very much. That's me done. Thank you so much, Stuart. And um, what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into the Q&A with, with, with all of our panellists. And what I'd suggest um, to the panel is the able George can, can moderate the screens that are in view. So if I can just suggest that as a panelist, if you pop yourself on mute and then pop your hand up if you want to make a comment and we'll come straight to you. Um, one of the first points though, you know, even if I take an example from our industry in textiles, you know, the, the consumer pull is really important. So the classic example of this is around fair trade and child labor. So if you go and buy a pair of jeans from a discount retailer for let's say 10 pounds for argument's sake the cost of the raw cotton in those jeans is probably about four pounds the retailer at most will have bought them for about five or six pounds so you now have two pounds to turn a ball of cotton into a finished product and ship that around the world the reality is you can't do that sustainably or ethically and so the bargain is you either believe the corporates in that case, or you have to make active choices as a consumer. And so I guess my first question to, to the panel and you know, whoever wishes to take it first, feel free, is what are you seeing in terms of you know, consumer insights into sustainability and how much is that influencing your work? And just before we come to you, if you've got any questions for our panel, you'll see a Q and A um, button right at the bottom of the screen pop them in there and we'll come to yours as well. But over to our panel to, to kick us off. Stuart. Yeah, so I, I think we, we see um, quite a lot of change in the public. We, we see it in what they dispose of. Uh, we've seen it that you know um, they, they consume and dispose of very different things when they're working at home than they work in the office. So when they do go back to a different style you know, post COVID, what they, what they do, we see demands from different uh, generations. Um, you make the point of textiles. I think uh, vintage uh, is now is more often. My daughter, who's who's eighteen, um, feels very proud when she finds a pair of Victoria Beckham ripped jeans in the uh, uh, Oxfam shop and, and takes them into school because she saved money by not spending. So we have to move to a different um, different process. But I, I, I think um, consumers are confused because we don't price all the externalities. We don't price the the water that goes into making the cotton. Um, that goes into your genes uh, and if we properly externalize the biodiversity natural capital cost of what we make 
then actually the informed choice would probably be the cheaper choice. Um, but because we don't necessarily have the right system and government has a role in that, as does, uh, as does the brands that produce it and, and others in terms of informing that process, we've got to bring a more level playing field into the story. Otherwise, we'll continually go, well, it's the cheapest and I can buy it and throw it away. And in many ways, uh, if you look at the growth in society, um, as we've industrialised and made things cheaper, we've encouraged the throwaway society because we've made it cheaper. Um, we didn't throw food away when we were uh, struggling to survive because we ate everything because we were struggling to survive. Um, and as we've not struggled to survive and society's grown, we haven't necessarily kept pace with the impact, the hidden impact of what we do. So I think pricing that externality and government changing to a more circular taxation system are essential to get the public to understand where they need to go and, and how they can make informed choices. Mm. That's a shame, though. I, I, I think the other thing that's really important is that um, like we're, we're almost reaching a point where we don't have a lot of active deniers in terms of that we need to do things, but there's a lot of passive people who simply don't act. And the challenge then is around information for the people who really do care, where oftentimes they will be pushing brands for changes which actually are less sustainable and you see, see this a lot in biodegradable packaging. Um, you started to see that in textiles, uh, you know, but, but I think it's a lot more difficult because we have a lot worse waste management ability there. But, you know, okay, let's go and, and change the biodegradable coffee cups when we don't have any mechanism other than it's gonna pollute uh, our paper waste stream. Uh, and without that proper information, brands or companies are innovating and they're adopting practices which actually are detrimental to our ability to capture value from waste. And so it's informed choices both for the people who care and as Stuart suggests, better information for, for really a systems approach to dealing with it. Sophie. Sorry, my, uh, my space bar stopped working. Um, I totally agree with both of uh, what Stuart and Mike have just said. I, I think the other thing is, is that the information is really important, but I think one of the main things that drive people's behavior is convenience. And actually, so it's about making the, the best choice, the right choice, the easiest choice. And I think in a way, what Stuart was talking about with the economic drivers, I mean, the fact that those things are called externalities when they're absolutely central to be able to make the thing, you know, like water and the planet. Um, how can we change the economic model so that those things are fundamentally reflected in what, what the price is and then people will make the cheapest, sim you know, simplest, easiest choice and it will also be the right choice. I think that that's really important too. Hmm. Sophie, can I just, we'll come to you just one second, Stuart, if I can just stick with you for one second, you know, one of our attendees has made, made, made a, a point which, you know, and, and it is actually quite prominent in the public, in the public consciousness. So, so Alexander says, you know, is recycling just a con if it all ends up in a field in Malaysia? And the truth is, you know, the comment might feel flippant in some ways, but, you know, we do know that quite a lot of consumers genuinely feel, why should I bother? Because so much journalism shows these big piles of waste all over the world. It'd be great to just get your thoughts, Sophie, on, you know, you, you're doing a lot of work around encouraging transparency on this. And do you think that's going to help people to realize that actually a lot of companies are doing this really well? And there are some offenders, but most of them are doing quite a good job when they want to. Yeah, I, I think it's I think that that is an incredibly important point. And that is why we think transparency is so key towards moving this behavior change. So. You know, there have been numerous studies, I think, that show that people have said that if they knew what happened to their recycling, they would be more inclined to recycle more. So how do we how do we provide those people with that information? Well, we need the transparency of the chains for us to be able to report on that. And I think, you know, at the moment, the problem is, is that our systems are set up to favour <laughs> options that aren't the best option so we have a producer you know producer responsibility extended producer responsibility but the packaging return notes and the packaging export return notes of which producers who put packaging out into the world have to pay for are it, the system is inherently bad and actually it makes more sense in a lot of ways to ship your stuff ship you know buy perns which are packaging export return notes to say that 
you've done all this recycling when actually what's happened is you've put it on a ship and assumed it's going to be recycled and so if we can start to show that and if we can start to then put pressure on the people that are choosing those options then I think that we can start to kind of really push from a market perspective and we can give the consumers that visibility of what actually happens and I think that that will be a virtual cycle because people will see where there's problems make the challenges and make choices around how to do it mm. better so great no, thank you Sophie and Stuart I believe you had a point before as well yeah no, I'll, 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 I'll pick up a couple of, I think um, picking up on Sophie's point I, I often use the example of the fuel price escalator and it was brought in by government as a green tax to try and prompt people to move away from fossil fuels um, but it very quickly got hidden within the taxation system uh, and therefore it felt like a tax um, and people reacted to it like a tax without recognising and we didn't really use the money raised to reinvest in public charging points say before we needed them so we we're on catch up um, and I do wonder um, if you do that simple information if you went to buy fuel and on your receipt in small letters it gave you the total price and then in big letters it says oh and by the way in buying this fuel you've just paid I know 72% of this is tax um, which it means in your hundred pound bill that you just paid 72 pounds of that is going to the government and if you did something different and if you do that continual nudge that your, your receipt told you a message and said this is the this is why it's costing you so much and you could do differently or if you drove better you'd fill up less then I, I think there's those those nudges I'm, I'm a great um, uh, a great in favor of personal carbon allowances I think kind of nectar because I think when people see what they do and how they buy them it's different and then going back to the, I think the point on traceability, um, I think from Sophie's presentation, we do need better data systems. We spend a lot of time in collecting data, so I know exactly how much I collect from a customer, uh, where it goes and those systems. Those systems are um, multiple. I have systems on trucks. I have systems in, in multiple facilities, complex supply chains. But also coming back to the macro effect, um, some of the materials go back to the source markets because you know as a country we buy more wind than we make ourselves and if if we really want to make more use of the recycler that we produce in this country we have to have industries in this country that want to use those products yeah. uh, and and therefore you've got this kind of micro impact what can i do individually as a person to the macro what i can do as government and just the last point i think people's concern um through covid and you know we're running services some of our services we've had to swap trucks because people at home are producing more recyclers and we've run out of room so we were using trucks that uh, on one contract where we had people that, that took separated materials you know paper in one box metals in another box um, and because of the volume were rising we had to move to trucks where it all went into the back of one truck mm -hmm. but because it looked like a disposal truck rather than a recycling truck there was lots of commentary in social media about oh we're just throwing our recycler away now um, and we had to positively push out because actually people recognize the source separated trucks as recycling trucks and the other trucks as disposal trucks even though they could do the same job the little changes in service you can see how people are super interested even when, when they've got pandemics to worry about and other things they were still interested and still wanted to know what's happening and why the system had changed slightly yeah. and um sophie i want to come to you in, a, in just a moment just to talk about kind of entrepreneurship and how you can you know really disrupt this as a startup but we had a, we had a great question actually in the Q&A which I'd like to just um, th throw over to Michael which is the questions from Jonathan at Swizzles and the question is multiple retailers such as Tesco do ask consumers to return flexible packaging to store and whilst that's necessary it's not sufficient if the UK is truly intent on encouraging recycling where possible why don't we introduce the curbside recycling of flexible packaging such as OPP, PET and PE? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I think it's one of, the, one of the things is that what the UK wants to do uh, and what local councils want to do are not necessarily aligned. And so you've got a complexity of responsibility there where you you might have a, a new policy come in that says, okay, we've got to go and do this, but um, how that policy is enacted is down to the local contract that the local council has negotiated. And the reality is, is if someone like Tesco says, okay, we want to take this type of flexible packaging back, or a construction company wants to segregate their flexible waste, 
that as a homo material is something which you can deal with, right? So if you know that all of those flexible or all of those films are the same thing, that's much more easy to recycle and to gain value from than a mixed system where you've got a, a variety of different uh, laminates, multi-lamellar materials that if you decide to process those and co-extrude those, you've got something that is really worthless. And so the, the essential part there is that it's actually a very complex material challenge around how you separate those materials to retain value. And if you were to, I, I encourage you to look at some of the videos on how uh, a MRF and a PERF facility works and how ridiculously complex that is. You imagine taking that, that process on, on processing hard plastics and throwing a bunch of flexible films in there. It's very, very difficult to do. So just because something has value, if you don't have a ready way to sort it, uh, it really becomes difficult. And it may be that chemical recycling is the route to, to be able to do that. But the reality is, is we've got a very difficult environment dealing with some like the plastic flows in an industrial setting or a back of house at a grocery store versus what would potentially happen at a curbside recycling. Now, Stuart, I want to come back to you in a moment to talk about to talk, talk about this point. But Sophie, we you know one of the things that's really fascinated me about your journey is you know you, you've created a business which is actually in a space which is dominated by you know very large players. So we're talking about you know very large corporations, governments, people like that. So when you're coming into a space like this, you know, as a small business that's then growing, how how are you able to actually persuade large incumbents? to work with you as an SME and, and as a sort of disruptive startup to actually help them in this space? Uh, well, in all honesty, we haven't persuaded many of the big incumbents to work with us yet. Um, but we have done a lot of work um, in, uh, in, in properly researching the industry and in properly um, being part of it and so really trying to um, understand the genuine problems and we're lucky that although in some ways we're sort of from outside the industry like my background is not in waste my co-founder Tom he spent time in the industry and so I think we're not just coming into a complex industry and saying oh don't worry we've fixed it we're coming in with a kind of embedded knowledge and and a kind of new perspective and I think what we've tried to really do is network talk to as many people as possible and really understand the problem so that then we can find genuine solutions and the the issue is is that they're not simple solutions these are complex wicked problems that require you know systemic fundamental changes to the way we do things and so yeah I mean in some ways who are we to come in and try and do that but also why not who else is doing it right I can't see anyone else yeah. trying to do the same sort of stuff that we're doing and there are lots of other interesting things going on in the industry I'm not in any way saying that's not the case but I think looking at it from that really fundamental perspective is something that is really mm. important to us and and since no one else is doing it then it falls on our shoulders so. yeah, yeah. Exactly. No. And, and in a moment, I'm, I'm going to come to, the, to, to all of the panel in a moment to talk about um, the sustainable development goals, which is a question that's come through. But Stuart, before we do, you know, I think one of the things that's really fascinated me is this is an industry, it was one of the largest industries that people take completely for granted because you just, you know, as a consumer, you just wipe your stuff in a bin and then some magic happens, right? But I'd love to talk to you about, you know, from your view as a business, are you seeing enough um, input of you know waste and sustainability as part of the ESG which is environmental and social governance agenda within businesses and how does it fit into a business like yours where actually this is your call? So I, 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 it's, it's an interesting question and it's part of that journey I think um, if I give a very simple example the reason we weigh our customers bins is because we can then identify if, if, if you know if if I wait, uh, we do a lot of work for universities, I can tell you that there are different departments in universities throw different materials away and some are better and worse. Um, and if I can give you that peer review and say, actually, if you follow the example of this university over here, or if you're a leader, then you can save some. So suddenly data, data I think, unlocks minimization and prevention more than anything else. So we've been on a journey for six years now, collecting data, 
which we give back to our customers with them and analyze them because it drives minimization. If you know what you're generating and you know what, why you're generating it, you can do that so to the point now that we're being asked to do single use plastic plans for customers to help them minimize. So actually one of the key, th key things that, that's unlocking that sort of a waste company only lives by dealing with people's waste. So you, our, our agenda is always to create more waste. No, our resource company is about managing everything. Waste doesn't isn't necessarily always an outcome. We can prevent it. We can do it, but we also have waste in you know uh, efficient routing of our trucks. So we we'll make sure that we don't use any more fuel than necessary. There's, there's waste in in the whole system, and I think taking that approach uh, as a business has has enlivened it. It's interesting the question you asked, you asked Sophie. Um, we were approached just over a year ago by a set of really motivated brands who place materials in flexible packaging into the market and that they asked the question what's the answer we said we don't know what the answer is but do you want to work together to do it and they said okay we'll do that so we spent a year working for them um, we've uh, done waste analysis to look bottom up how much is how much of the flexible packaging appears in what part of the value chain we've looked at if we did collect it what we do with it and obviously um, you know, we have plants in in the Netherlands and Germany that separate flexibles into their different formats so it's to be, it's technically possible we just don't do it yet and we've just finished for them how to collect and, yeah. and coming back to that systems point really interesting um, we're proposing in this country to introduce DRS deposit return schemes one of the outcomes of deposit return schemes is we take material that's currently collected at curbside and put it into a different collection system. That frees up space on those trucks. So the big question that we've been posing to government is, if we create space on trucks that's now not going to be usually utilized in the mm -hmm. same way, to retain efficiency, what else can we add in to make it work? So it's a very different question. And that, that, that systems approach from designer to, to putting back material into the system and knowing those solutions, is 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 where uh, I think uh, is, is is a fundamental difference between a waste company and a resource company because a resource company has to work with the system and and save as well as manage. Thank you, Stuart. Um, now a question for the whole panel, and, and again, you know, whoever wants to take it first, just pop pop your hand up. But you know, reference reference points and measurement are such an important part of this journey. And around the world, we know when you read ESG reports you see that very commonly businesses are using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as their reference point for what they're doing. And Ram Shankar from Equitas Engineering has actually asked, you know, so far, he's not really heard any mention of the SDGs so far in today's talks and presentations. You know, are you as organizations aligned with the SDGs? And what are your views on those as a reference point for sustainability? Uh, Professor. I'm really only my mom calls me professor, so Mike is fine. Um, so I, I mean, I I, I, I I stand corrected, Mike. Over to you. I, I I think what's really interesting about anything that is a broad vision goal is that the devil is in the detail, and so I think having a, a vision or having a desire. So the University of Manchester, you know, touts itself as as being very good at at targeting those sustainable development goals. There's real challenges, however, once you say, okay, let's deal with this specific problem. And this is where really the innovation needs to happen is yes, we should have alignment to sustainable development goals and, and we do, but there are unintended consequences around a lot of the potential interventions that are then proposed. And so if you want to do something, you've really got to understand the history of, of where you're coming from to be able to get to that in innovation and what is potentially going to happen to, let's say, Stuart's Murph after some change has happened, right? And that's the real challenge is, yes, we should target those goals, but if we do not pay attention to the specificity, we will be worse off than if we hadn't made an intervention. And that's what's happening now in many cases. Great, thank you. Stuart, Sophie, would you like to add anything on the SDGs? Yeah, I think, I think for us, um, we, we've had a team of people working um, through, and, and, and I do think they're, 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 they're known, but they're not commonly known. They're not common language. And I think what we've been trying to do is, is translate them into common language. And if we do a beach clean, um, the beach clean is there. People don't do it because it's an SDG 14 goal. It's, they do a beach clean because they care about the environment, they care about their beach, and they take local ownership. 
Um, but if we're linking that process, so when we talk about a reach clean, we link it to one of the SDGs, um, becomes a super important point of people recognizing that actually the small things they do contribute to the big goals because they sound, you know, it sounds big, it sounds international, it sounds very top down. And we, we, so we're doing a lot of work on that. We've, we've adopted uh, a metric for, for the Manchester contract uh, on social profit, which brings a number of different things in terms of how we lock in local supply chains, local training, local education, as well as the environmental goals and things like that. So um, it's, it's about working to them and translating them into actions that our staff recognize. So how do I get the driver to understand driving better is, is, a, um, is a good answer? How do I get uh, uh, the, the public to recognize that if they can help us and they can improve quality, they can do different things? I'll go and turn the light on in a second. Um, uh, the energy saving, I haven't moved quickly enough. Um, so the, the, I think there's the, the, the SDGs are great uh, as a foundation, but you have to take that and convert it into things that people can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, they're just a language that people in universities and high uh, parts of businesses use. I don't, I don't really have a huge amount to add other than to say, I suppose, for us as a tiny organisation that for we're, we're values driven and defining our values really early on was really important and i think if we were to do an exercise to see how they map to the sdgs we'd find a lot of a lot of kind of um connections and 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 overlap there but we, that's not something that we've done because there's four of us <laughs> and our values speak to us in the words that we want them to so that's kind of what we've gone for yeah and perhaps Sophie, if we stick if we stick with you for a moment, and then we'll we'll come around to the panel come around the panel on this as well. But you know, you very commonly hear um, you know stakeholders and shareholders and and albeit not very progressive businesses talk about everything in terms of business case around sustainability. And the truth is, you know, I think for, for businesses they can find a good business case for being more sustainable using data in that journey and actually making this part of their core values and maybe so if we start if we start with you you know if you had to talk to one of those businesses how would you help them understand you know the value the value proposition the business case for sustainability so i've got two examples of local businesses that i think really highlight why sustainability is a really good business case so the first is um Crystal Doors in Rochdale um, and they're an SME and they have put in incredibly ambitious um, like decarbonisation goals like ahead of the you know what we've done regionally ahead of national stuff and they are going at them like hell for leather and I'm so impressed with the stuff that they're doing and so on their website they say that they've spent about one and a half million in investing in in the process of becoming carbon neutral, but it says that they so literally says on the website, this may sound like a significant outlay, but most of our investments are actually cash flow neutral or cash flow positive. So they're paying for those, those, you know, those developments them by by putting in energy saving things by put they've got you know a whole roof of solar panels now, they've put in a clever biomass boiler, like, and all of these outlays are things that are going to save them a huge amount of money in the long run that makes business sense they're not a massive ex, you know rich company that've got loads of money to spend but they've been clever about the way they do these things and then the, the second example is Alderley park and the waste team there segregate i mean it's incredible to go and see if you're a waste geek they segregate almost every single type of waste so their old machines and stuff from the the labs um from the cafeterias things like that they strip them down. They've got a team of people that strip those down to their component parts and they separate them out. So then they've got, you know, aluminium and plastic and steel and copper and whatever. And they find the best routes for those materials as materials. And they've gone from having waste as a cost, you know, like most businesses do, to actually employing four people and making a profit on that. Like, and it's more yeah. sustainable. I don't know. I just think that, that you, you just have to think about it the right way and, and go about it in a yeah. creative way. And Stuart, we'll come to you in just one moment because I think it's going to be interesting to get to get your views from the big corporate world. But, but for, for Mike, see, did it properly this time. But for Mike, um, you know, I think particularly because you're working at that kind of sharp end in materials research, you know, this is always the real buffer of any company arguing business cases. Oh, 
we can't use a sustainable material because it's going to be too much more expensive. But the reality is quite different. So, you know, from, from, from what you've seen of the, you know, in the research and the science as well, you know, how would you speak to a business that's pushing back and against there being a business case for this? I'm, I, I think there's sort of two things. So um, is that business making a change because they feel pressure from the public, right? So are there, are there customers who are asking for a change? Oftentimes, then they're looking for something which costs the same amount, but they're not, they're thinking about the cost of that material and they're not thinking about whether or not that's actually fit for purpose. And so then we do an intervention with them which says, okay, well, these are, these are the drop-in solutions you can get. Where you see you know, more difficulty is, is perhaps in the innovation space where something is working on a small scale. So you know, we would have uh, a polymer that we invented that seems neat, has really good properties, there's a lot of curation and care and testing that needs to go into it if it's going to leave our labs because we actually care about the fate of the materials. And so I think it's a temporal one where the immediacy that someone wants a solution so that they can tell their shareholders, look at what we've done, is, doesn't match what is available out there. And that leads to adoption of things uh, which then need to change. And the classic is, is is, you know, so Sophie's saying, well, you can go and you can make money from this. I would say, if you don't think about the sustainability of your materials, it's going to cost you money because you're going to make a change. Mm. And then in six months time, when you realize that uh, your compostable cup is not compostable <laughs> in the United Kingdom, you've got to make another change back uh, to something. And so mm. if it's an adoption thing, we, we basically say increase the recycled content of your product. That's the biggest driver that you can make to feed change and feed investment in infrastructure, which is needed in the UK to promote a more systemic change. And Stuart, I'd love to bring you in on this as well, because again, you know, Suez is a huge business. And so, you know, this is part of your core business proposition. But when you're out there speaking to businesses as well, do you see any resistance against this? And what do you feel is the real business case for sustainability, whether businesses are resistant or not? So I, I, I think there's, there's two parts. Do we, do we see, I, I see, we see a lot of angst. A lot of people want to know an answer, but they didn't, can't go and get there. There's lots of big things like, you know, the oil price dropping, um, which uh, for some industries is an opportunity to reduce their cost base by going to the cheaper virgin polymer. Others, look at a business plan that's based on a, uh, maybe a medium to long term, in which case they'll stick with, uh, with, with recycle content. So you, I think you'll always have that flux because different businesses in different, uh, are at different phases. But um, in many ways, it's, it's the lack of knowledge. You know, as a business, the waste that we produce as a business is very, very small compared to what we manage as a business for our customers. We're a service industry. Um, and helping people understand what they produce, why they produce it, giving them information. Now, we, we often see recessions before they occur because we see buying patterns change, more pizza boxes rather than eating out, those sort of things. So you, you start to see um, that, that that's as valuable now in, kind of in the mirror of Minute Nectar. Um, and companies understanding, if I do this, what happens? And, and the work we've done with the, with the, the brands that wanted flexibles, often the questions were if i change to this you know if i go to compostable what happens if i go to fiber based what happens and once they can get those answers they understand the system they start to make informed choices because they want to do the right thing and i, I think a lot of companies want to do the right thing but they just don't know what the right thing means mm. um, and as a business we spend more and more time um showing people taking people to a, to a, a recycling center and showing them what happens so, you know we took a Unilever to one of our plants just post Christmas and post Christmas is an awful time because at Christmas we all buy lots of different things we don't normally buy you know those big quality street boxes that we don't have almost of the year but we buy them at Christmas consuming them with so we have lots of different materials with different shape sizes compositions that come in it's the worst time ever because then the consumers have chosen to bloom what they buy and how they consume that's the reality of what we deal with and then if you can get conformity and need people to work together in designing and for flexibles we've converted hundreds of different flexible type packaging into seven families or six families and everything else which means we can have a common language and i often think that common language 
between the different parts of the system open up a very different debate because you make it not complicated you know uh, if it's got an aluminium there call it something with an aluminium there and then people recognize it and you can have a common language it doesn't really matter all the other complicated bits that go into packaging design um, and I think unpicking that technical bit and making it simple and understandable is a key unlocker because I think there is a desire there to do things better they just can't necessarily communicate it or understand what better means yeah it's interesting because you know in software you had you had a similar problem with these kind of different silos and it's almost like maybe it's time for a full waste api which i think is almost almost sophie's business um but mike what, what one thing which I, I was really keen to ask you know in your presentation you were talking about all, all these various materials but i think this pace of materials innovation is also just astonishing right now and it'd be great mike to get some of your just insights into what's on the horizon because every now and again, you know, I'll pop into the university, see what's happening, and you're like, wait, we can we can actually do this now. I, I, I mean, I think what's really neat is that the pace of material innovation is faster than life cycle analysis. And so you've got um, sort of a, a innovation arm that needs data to support it. Um, I would say that there's sort of three things that are really quite interesting from um, a new materials kind of perspective. And the first is, is this idea of moving from um, mechanical recycling to other forms of recycling, whether that be a biological recycling or a chemical recycling. And this is all around selectivity. And so let's say you have a, a multi-laminate material or you've got um, you know, a, a polyethylene terephthalate laminated with something else. If you can do a selective depolymerization of the PET, you leave behind the other components in a pristine form, which could then become uh, something that is mechanically recycled. And so I would say it's, it's about coupling different parts of the innovation chain together to recognize value and components. Classic example of this is let's say you were to have a medicine, right? And we had a, there was a question before around a medical packaging, which has this huge extra complexity around the regulatory framework. That idea of being able to decouple or depolymerize those different components actually allows you to retain value in the individual ones. So similar to Sophie's suggestion of we're gonna have an, a person who takes apart uh, you know, a, uh, a big piece of equipment and recover those value components, being able to do that from a materials perspective is important. The second is around composites. I mean, we think about, okay, we're gonna recycle this uh, PET bottle. How do you recycle an airplane, right? And getting to the stage where you can start to recycle composite materials, uh, car body parts, plane body parts, wind turbine blades, that's a big growth area and is really, really challenging from a materials perspective. And then the third one would be thinking about biodegradables where you can't recover it. So it's easy for us to think about waste when it's something we physically put into our bin, but all of those other flows that we have, which are actually really difficult to uh, capture, and we think back to that uh, example around uh, the foam, it's gonna absorb our meat juice. Those are the priority areas where we gotta think about how the material world fits into our food waste world fits into those other flows of materials that we have. So the interface between different flows, all of which are active research areas at University of Manchester and lots of other places. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the aircraft. I mean, what, one, of, one of the odd uh, <laughs> highlights of one of our supply visits across to India was um, on the west coast of India, you have a lot of beaches there where you have the breakers yards for oil tankers and large cruise ships. And one of them was not terribly far, actually, from a production site that we were looking at. So we, 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 and we actually were there the day that they were ramming a giant oil tanker onto the beach, at which point people then physically climbed across this oil tanker and broke it down for scrap, which was perhaps one of the singular most dangerous occupations I've ever seen. And it is really interesting that you think we have oil tankers, trucks, vehicles, all this infrastructure we're building, but what happens to it when it, when it dies? Um, I think one of the other things I'd love to do is, you know, I'm conscious of, of, of time, you know, we're getting towards 11 and I want to just make sure that we also think about practically what, what happens next. So Sophie, I'd love to start with you, but you know, what do you think, you know, obviously government plays a big role in this and as does policy. And what do you think are the kind of 
policy mechanisms or the regulations or the things that could happen at a national or international level that could really help to move the needle on sustainability and really make it a, a better part of how we produce and consume? Okay, that's a big question um, uh, to answer concisely. I mean, my my feeling is that we need to redesign the economy, that, that the, the way that it works currently just actually accelerates our demise by forcing us to want to keep growing and consume and grow and consume and grow until we're all dead and everything burnt. So uh, I think that the, it's not an easy answer, but I think the thing that we need to do is is move away from that growth mindset and think instead about, you know, how do we how do we design a regenerative economy that is happy to not just continually grow and instead is about doing things that are better for society and the environment and our well-being and you know and everything like that I, I mean and prosperous I'm not saying not prosperous but just not that kind of insane unchecked growth so great thank you Sophie Stuart uh, so it is a tough question I, I think government has to give direction and explain why because you need to take people with you so they, they, there has to be some clear messaging about this is why we're doing it um, they also have to take action themselves and we have a very linear taxation system so it's no point the government talking about green and circular and sustainable and then um, using the taxation system and relying on it on a linear manner so they've got to show goodwill and green procurement and, and, and in, in some ways they're doing that so I think clear sense of direction some clear drivers um, I think uh, coming back to the trust point, the visibility, I think, uh, would people react differently to the fuel price escalator if they'd seen the reinvestment from the money raised in providing more cycle lanes, in providing charging points? They would, they, you, you, you then assign one action with a, with a reinvestment in your society. Um, I, I think we'd have a very different reaction to it if, if you communicated. So I, th I think they have to translate that into real, real terms. And uh, then I think what, what happens is, those, those uh, companies and organizations that are now uh, leading that charge are followed by the majority. There'll always be some that, that will stick and, and want to stay. But uh, I, I did some work for the EU a number of years ago, and one of the key questions we said, no linear industry ever votes for circularity um, unless they have a transition. And I think one of the big things that we do for lots of our customers and we're doing for some of the supply chains is understanding what the transition looks like great to have a goal but how do I get there how do I become what I need to be and, and how do I transit so that I can be more sustainable I can be more socially responsible um, but at the same time I don't go bust on the journey because then I failed miserably to, 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 to marry almost bringing back to that kind of triple bottom line process well we have to transit we have to do it within a timeline we have to do it quickly but we have to do it so that we sustain all of those three things together because people aren't uh, Unemployed people that are more environmentally friendly isn't necessarily what we're looking for. We want productive people, we want productive societies, but we want a productive environment and a productive, sustainable consuming um, world that, that has a different metric to it. So I, th I think government can set that scene for all of us um, and empower people to get on. And part of what you're doing today is, is, you know, is, is empowering people to say, well, innovation isn't, isn't the realm of government or big companies or small companies, it's the realm of everybody. Thank you, Stuart. And, and actually, for anyone that's interested, there's a, there's a, there's a really interesting book um, by Michael Sandel called The Moral Limits of Markets. And it's actually a fascinating look at very similar topics because it starts to think about the kind of how do we cost this? You know, if we start to really show people the cost of what's happening and what, what they're doing and what their behaviours are doing, could that influence policy further? So there's lots of really interesting questions that are emerging. And, you know, just from the thought provocations, the Q&A and the presentations today, I think we've all taken away a lot of new insights about, you know, the power of data, you know, how large corporations are handling this, how the, the intersection between SMEs and corporations is, is getting ever stronger. And also, you know, how science is really leading the way in providing us the materials, insights and tools to make sure that everything we do can become more sustainable. So, you know, Thank you to all our panelists and guests today. I'd like to also I just hand over to George, who's going to take us all through the next steps of how we stay engaged with this fantastic programme moving forward. So over to you, George. 
Thank you, thank you, everyone. And uh, such an interesting discussion. Like, um, I think it's 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 apparent from how many questions we had in, and it's almost hard to stop discussing it and and trying to understand the different complexities of the problem and the different sides of it. Um, so, yeah, I want to just share quickly my screen and show you the next uh, steps and just remind a bit to people that are um, with us today. Uh, what are the next steps and what is going to be happening um, next week? So I'm bringing this up. So um, as we discussed at the beginning of the of the event, um, this is Innovate Manchester program, which is uh, being split between a um, conference and um, an innovation lab for each of the themes. Um, so next week is going to be the Innovation Lab, which is going to take place between Wednesday and Thursday. Um, there are a number of challenges that have been coming through the chat via email, via the Q&A, as well as um, there are a few companies, that we, large corporations that we have been already in touch and helping them, supporting them shape the challenges. Um, so we will go through the Innovation Lab a process of understanding and analyzing the problem and then um, diving into the solution space. And um, the next steps is from corporates to getting that uh, via info at uh, midas.org.uk um, until 9 a.m. Uh, tomorrow. The SMEs that are having an interest in being part of the Innovation Lab um, will receive an email uh, following that, which will describe exactly the process and is going to be a registration process to express an interest on these challenges. Um, and then if we could kindly ask you to be part both days. Um, as I said, this is a full day workshop normally, but taking place virtually, we had to split it in uh, half. So um, we give, um, we are conscious of, of people being a whole day in front of, of a screen. Um, that is all from me and I think we've reached the end. A big thank you to everyone and especially the speakers um, and for you Vikas for um, chairing the whole event, amazing job. Thank you for being with us um, and we'll be in touch soon with everyone.